Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday morning service. I trust you are well. I hope you are being blessed in the Lord. I want to begin today by uh, um, talking through some words of uh, Psalm 145 and verses 1 to 3. Psalm 145, verses 1 to 3. I will exalt you, my God and King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness is unsearchable. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, you have said that you will not always strive with us, nor will you harbour your anger forever. You do not treat us as our sins deserve, nor do you repay us according to our iniquities. Your love for those who fear you is more than we can imagine, as high as the heavens are above the earth. And as far as the east is from the west, this is how far you have removed our sins from us. All this through Jesus Christ our Lord. And just as a father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on those who fear you. We are in your debt and ever so grateful for your love. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, together gifting, gifting us salvation and the hope of a joyful future. We thank you and praise you. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So here's Ben with the reading from 2 Corinthians for this morning. Thanks, Ben. Morning, everyone. And I trust that you're all going well. I've got an amazing reading for you this week. It's from 2 Corinthians 13, 11 to 14. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you forever. This is the word of the Lord. Now I'd like to invite Johnson to share his message. Uh, have a great week. Good morning, church. Um, today is Wednesday, our midweek service. And um, from the readings to Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 14, I've come up with the theme, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. If you ask God the Father, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the question, will the real God stand up? Then all three would have to stand in order to tell the truth. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, let me share with you that the Bible teaches three truths about God, and all of which are necessary to know God, none of which can be denied. I call them the Trinity truth. There is one God eternal and indivisible. This one God is three persons, each distinct from each other. Each person is fully God, co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal. Admittedly, this is obviously a deep subject that calls for a serious thought and contemplation. But it is well worth it, for as Charles Hudson Spurgeon said, Nothing will so enlarge the intellect and magnify the whole soul of a man as a devotee, earnest, continued investigation of the whole subject of the Trinity. So the doctrine of the Trinity may be the greatest distinctive characteristics of Christianity. No other religion in the world is or even has been a Trinitarian religion. Judaism, Islam, the Unitarians, and the Jehovah's Witness all deny the doctrine of the Trinity. Even though the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, the truth of the Trinity is found throughout the Bible. The very passage we have as a foundation, verse, uh, chapter two, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, is a benediction, a prayer that is prayed to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. 
as you are going to see, if you are going to know God, you must know God as Trinity, or you cannot know God at all. And that is very true. So to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And I want to give you warning that we are going to start a doctrine that in no one sense is incomprehensible. The Trinity is a mystery because it is about God. And God is a mystery. 1 Timon chapter 3 verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, prayed among the Gentiles, believed in all the world, received up in glory. So God cannot be reduced to human logic. The finite can never fully understand the infinite. Now we should try to understand all of God that we can, but we will never understand all of God that there is. God himself said in Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, it is not that God is illogical. Rather, God is beyond logic. The great Methodist preacher, John Wesley, once said, Bring me a worm that can comprehend a man, and then I'll bring you a man that can comprehend the true God. So there are two things alone that human mind really cannot understand or comprehend. One is infinity, and the other is eternity. With infinity, there is no beginning. With eternity, there is no ending. Yet, we know that God is both infinite and eternal. He has neither beginning nor ending. That is simply incomprehensible because everything we know and we see has a beginning and an ending, except God. So God has even left us clues throughout his universe of Tritanian nature. There are three basic features of this universe. There is space, matter, and time. Space is length, breadth, and height. Matter is solid, liquid, and gas. Time is past, present, and future. We even see it in ourselves. Man is body, soul, and spirit. Likewise, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, even though we have clues to the Trinity, the reason to it is so difficult to understand and comprehend is because there is no comparison to the Trinity. There is nothing to which the Trinity can be compared to because God cannot be compared to anything because there is only one God. You can compare one soccer player with another one, one singer with another one, one athlete with another one, but you cannot compare God to any other God, for there is no other God except the one God. Isaiah 4 verse 18 says, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likens will you compare to him? Which means you can't compare God with anything. Augustine one of the theologians was walking along a beach one day puzzling over the Trinity when he observed a young boy with a bucket running back and forth pouring water into a little hole. He said, what are you doing? The boy said, I'm trying to put the ocean into this hole. Augustine said at that moment, he realized he had been trying to put an infinite God into his finite mind. My friend, you cannot do that. The infinite will not fit into the, inf into the finite. You really can never understand the Trinity. But as one person has widely said, define the Trinity, you will lose your mind. But deny the Trinity, you will lose your soul. The Trinity is majesty, we must surely believe. So the word Trinity comes from the Latin Trinitas, which literally means a group of three. We get the words trial and triad from that word, I found it somewhere incredible that in the Bible there is literally a trinity of truth about the trinity. So there is one thing the Jews, the Muslims, the Unitarians, and the Jehovah's Witness agree with us, and that is there is one God. Just take a few verses that remind us of this. Isaiah 45 verse 5 says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will guide you, though you have not known me. So which means there is no other God. One Timothy Chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and the man Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4 states, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other but God alone. So, infant, even when the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
are mentioned together. Oftentimes there is a reminder that they are one. Every new convert is to be baptized, not in the names, plural, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but rather in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how we understand it. So let it be plainly stated that Christians are not polytheists. That is, we do not believe in many gods. Nor are we treatheists. We do not believe in three gods. But just like our friends who may be Jewish, Muslim, Unitarian, or Jehovah's Sweden, we are monotheists. We believe in one God. But the Bible teaches the second truth, and that is God is three persons. We see this in every verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1 verse 1, the Hebrew word for God is the word Elohim, which literally translated as God see. It is plural noun. So the suffix im in Hebrew gives a singular noun, a plural form. A cherub is in one angel, cherubim are several angels. A seraph is one angel, seraphim are several angels. Elo is God, singular, Elohim literally is God's plural. So, but in this same verse, there is something else is very interesting. The verb created is singular and not plural. So you have a plural noun, Elohim, coupled with a singular verb, created. You see the same thing in Genesis 1 verse 26, 6, where God said, let us make men in our image according to our likeness. God refers to himself in the plural. But then in the very next text, verse 27, we read, so God, Elohim, created men in his own image. So the plural hour in verse 26 equals the singular in verse 27. You find exactly the same thing in Isaiah 6 verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Singular. And who will go for us? Plural. Once again we have the plural equal to the singular. Or what we would call a plurality in a unit. So the bedrock simple principle of Judaism is what is called the Shema. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. But even here buried a trinity truth. Because here is what Israel was to hear. The Lord, Yahweh, singular. Our God, Elohim, plural. The Lord is one. So the word one is there is fascinating. It is the Hebrew echad, which conveys the idea of one in multiple, or one as in a group. In Genesis 2, verse 24, we are told that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That is you, you have two, but the two are becoming one. So in Genesis 11 verse 6, God referring to the child Babel, said, indeed the people are one. Now there are many people, but the men were one. So the word one literally means one unit. It is a collective one. Remember again the word trinity, the prefix three literally means three. Unit literally means one. Three unit, three in one. And that is why how we understand it. Now, each person in the Godhead is distinct from the other person. That is, the Father is not the Son. In John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning there was both the Word and the Lord Jesus and God. They were together. So the Son is not the Spirit. Jesus said in John 16 verse 7, concerning the Holy Spirit, I will send him to you. Furthermore, the Spirit is not the Father. Jesus said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, in John 14, verse 26. So, but even though these three persons in the God yet are distinct, again, there is only one God. Now, many people protest what we believe at this point, saying, wait a minute, one plus one plus one plus one is equal to three. Well, they are mathematically right, but they are theologically wrong. Space is length, width, and height. If you want to know the total space in a room, you do not add length and width and height. You multiply length, width and height. So it is with God. The triune God is not three gods, nor is God in three parts. In one plus one plus one, each one is only part. But in multiplied, one multiplied by one multiplied by one, each is the whole. For the whole is in each. God is not one plus one plus one plus one equals three. God is one times one times one times one equals one. That's what it is. But if there is a third truth taught about God, which is this. Each person is God. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14, 
You notice the name of Jesus comes first. Now theologians usually speak of three divine persons in the same order. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But in the Bible, that is not the case. It is interesting that there are 12 places in the New Testament where the three names are grouped together. They are arranged in six different ways, and each of the three names occupies each of the three places twice. There is nothing sacred about the order. We must not think of any person in the Godhead as being inferior to the other one, or in any way less than fully God. We all know that the Lord is God. First Kings 8 verse 6 says, All the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. But Philippians 2 verse 11 says that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17 says, it says, the Lord is spirit. Well, is the Lord God? Is the Lord Jesus? Or is the Lord the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. It's everything. It's all those three. We all know that the one called Father is God. But Titus 2 verse 13 says that we should be looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Acts 5 verse 3 to 4 tells that the lying to God and lying to the Holy Spirit are one and the same thing. So, who is God? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit again. The answer is yes, he is. So who created this world? In Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Yet Colossians 1 verse 16 speaking of Jesus says, For by him all things were created that in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. That is through Jesus Christ. So then Job 26, 13 says, By his spirit he adorned the heavens. Well, who created all of this? So God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? Your guess, maybe it's true. You see, the Son is not God. He is not God the Junior. The Holy Spirit is not God the Third. God is not divided into three equal parts. God is one being. But he is three in relationship, personality, and function. I want to state to you plainly and bluntly why the start of the Trinity is so vital and important. If it were not for the Trinity, there would be no salvation. And there would be no one saved. In salvation, each member of the Godhead plays a vital part, and every part is necessary for salvation to be accomplished. In Ephesians 1, we are told of the role of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit plays in the salvation of all sinners. Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 4 tells that God thought our salvation. Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he would be holy and without blame before him in love. So salvation was in the mind of God the Father before the world came into existence, or a sin came into the world. So then in Ephesians 1 verse 7 tells that the Lord Jesus bought our salvation, in him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. God the Son left heaven, obeying God the Father, even to the point of death, and shed his blood that we might have the one thing we need for our sins, and that is forgiveness. Finally, Ephesians 1 verse 13 tells us that the Spirit wrought our salvation. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Jesus made it plain, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, and you must be born of the spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven, in John 3, verse 5 and 6. So 1 Peter 1, verse 2 tells us exactly the same thing. God select the sinner. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Jesus saves the sinner. For obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit sanctifies the sinner. In sanctification, the spirit of the spirit. To put it another way, God is the Lord of salvation. Jesus is the Lord of salvation. The Spirit is the life of salvation. Now, what does all of this have to do with you and me? Well, just this. If you want to know God, you can only know God in the Trinity. You cannot get to know God the Father unless you go through God and the Son. So Jesus said, no one comes with the Father except through me. Furthermore, you cannot get to know the Son unless you are brought by the Holy Spirit. For only when the Spirit of truth has come, you will be guided to know into the truth. In John 16, verse 18. So Ephesians 2, 18, 
Not only is a, a, a great return at verse, but it summarizes why all of us this is important. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You go to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit, otherwise you can never know God. And I, I, I think that is the reason why this verse was even put on the Trinity Sunday. Well, that is the truth about the Trinity. And it is so simple, to, so profound, and yet so beautiful. Three in one, one in three, and the one in the middle died for me. And that is Jesus Christ. For me to have salvation. Believe in the Trinity. For your salvation to come. May the good Lord bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord, our Sovereign, how much is your name in all the earth? Lord, we bring you our prayers for the world, the church and of all creation. Loving God, we bless the church into your hands. Guide and lead it to be a sign of unity and reality. Loving God, we bless into your hands the places where war has become a way of life. Use us as bearers of your peace. Loving God, we place into your hands the lives of those who suffer from COVID-19 and other ailments like HIV and AIDS. Give us the grace to carry our one another's burdens. Loving God, receive the prayers we offer. In Christ, we live with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. I will call uh, Pastor Chris to come and give uh, grace. So before we finish up for this morning, uh, please receive the blessing. I'd like to pray uh, the ironic blessing over you, firstly in my rather poor Hebrew, and secondly in English, so that you can understand what the words mean. Let's pray. Yevarekaka Adonai Vishmareka Yair Adonai Panavaleka Vihoneka Yesa Adonai Panavaleka the Assemblicha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace, the peace which surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.